So, hello everyone. I'm uh, John Moon. I'm a software engineer with Qualcomm, and I'm going to talk about to you today about the driver development kit and how we in integrated it into our workflow. Um, so I'll just tap here. Yeah, I think I got it. Uh, here's the agenda. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to get into it. Um, so first, at a high level, I'm going to describe what the DDK is. So Google has this multi-year effort to move the entire Android build system to use Bazel, and they're starting with targeting the kernel build stuff. So that's the kernel itself and uh, any external modules. The part of Cleef uh, uh, is the framework that they developed to build the kernel stuff with Bazel, and one part of Cleef is called the Driver Development Kit, or DDK. And as of Android 14, it's str strongly recommended. So before DDK, I'm going to kind of give you guys an idea of what we were doing to build our external modules. Uh, for some background, we have a kernel team. That's the team I'm on. We manage our kernel platform tree and uh, any common build definitions, uh, ABI compliance stuff, that, that sort of thing. And then we also have tech teams. And these teams are split out into uh, different Git repos and have a different place in the vendor tree. And they're, sp they're specifically focused in a particular tech area, so display or WLAN, some, something like that. And we have about 50 modules that we build out of tree from these tech packs. So before Bazel came along, we were building with build.sh, as most of you likely were. And tech pack source code would live outside of the kernel platform tree. And they would have their module source code. They would have a K build file and a make file. Uh, and then we would have an android.mk file in that tech pack repo. And that's kind of how we linked it to the top level Android build. And you can see in this snippet here, uh, we call out to this shared make file build external kernel module.mk. And uh, yeah, all, so all tech packs call out to this uh, .mk file. And then in turn, that .mk file goes and calls out to build module.sh. That's, that's a script we use that eventually calls this make command that many of you may be familiar with that goes and builds a module out of tree. So the output KO comes and jumps back up the stack to the Android build system. So with DDK, build.sh is gone now. Uh, that's been replaced with uh, Cleef Bazel build commands. So to build our kernel module and to build our entry vendor modules, we have a Bazel build command instead of build.sh. And all that's defined in our uh, Bazel files in repo. Uh, tech packs, instead of having their K build and make file, now have a DDK module definition. So they have a build.bazel file as well. And here's an example of what a DDK definition might look like. So you can see at the top, they're loading the DDK module rule from Cleef. And that's, that's kind of like a Python import statement. And you define your inputs, your outputs, uh, any dependencies you have, and the kernel you want to build against. And no, notably, K build and make file are gone. Since the top level uh, Android build is not using Bazel yet, we're still using Android.mk, and we're still calling out to build external kernel module.mk. Uh, but now, when we go down that chain to our build script, we're invoking a Bazel build command to build the DDK target um, instead of that raw make command. Uh, one note about this method is right now, uh, Cleef assumes that all of your sources are underneath the kernel platform tree. So we make this sim link back to the vendor tree to kind of trick Cleef into thinking that it's, uh, it's under kernel platform. This has to do with how the Bazel workspaces uh, work. So now after our experience moving everything over to DDK, I'm gonna go over some pros and cons. Uh, so the biggest pro we've seen from the kernel side is the ability to limit kernel header visibility. So when a DDK module is built, all of the public kernel headers and all of its sources are dropped into a sandbox. And if a module is trying to use a private kernel header, such as you know, MM slab here, uh, it's gonna say, hey, I can't find that file. It wasn't copied into the sandbox, so it, it's not visible. Uh, this revealed a bunch of places in various modules where we were using the private headers that we should not have been, and uh, we were able to fix most of the issues. Uh, another big pro is having some upstream support. So M Matthias and, and Yifan have been, been great at uh, helping us uh, mold, mold Cleef to our use case and uh, get all the features that our various tech packs needed into DDK. 
Um, another big pro is having less boilerplate. So in some cases with, uh, with DDK, we were able to drop about half the lines of code that we have to express our builds. And that's largely because we can uh, kind of vectorize and loop with, with the Starlark macros. So uh, there, there are ways to do kind of elegant things to, to reduce your uh, build definition logic. Another big pro, you can query your graph. So you can ask these kinds of questions of your build system and say, you know, hey, which modules depend on me? And it can go answer that kind of question for you. It, it can be handy in unraveling a big uh, thatch work. Another pro, you can pass an extra flag to your Bazel build command. It'll generate an output file, which you can then load into Chrome and see this kind of uh, performance profiling graph. This is a great way to identify if there are any specific log jams in how your build is working, any dependencies that shouldn't really be there, uh, see if things can be parallelized maybe. Uh, and then another big one is the interdependencies. So it was very common with our previous build system where tech packs would want to depend on symbols from each other or uh, headers from each other. And there wasn't a very clean way of doing it. It was kind of tedious having to uh, pass the, the make file includes and concatenate your module.simbers. So DDK simplifies all of that. Uh, if you are a module that wants to provide something to other modules, you can list the public headers. And these are headers that are in your, um, in your build directory that you would like to be exposed to other modules. Um, and then you can also use uh, native Bazel visibility to define which modules are allowed to depend on you. And then if you want to depend on a module, you just have to add the other module to your list of depths. It's, it's pretty much that easy. You, you run your build command, it'll copy the public headers from that dependent module, uh, and it'll also handle all the modules.simvers stuff for you. So that, that's all been radically simplified. Uh, the biggest con we saw during our transition was simply needing to learn a new build system. Uh, a lot of kernel developers are not familiar with Bazel or Starlark, so, so that was kind of a, a shock trying to integrate that. Um, there was also a lot of confusion around the build phases of Bazel, so th things would pop up with errors and say, uh, oh, I'm not even building that part of the build. Why, why is that coming? And So th there's confusion about the analysis phase and so on. Uh, and then another thing was seemingly simple things turned out to be very difficult. So uh, Bazel forbids you from doing things like polluting your build with environment variables. Uh, so, you know, things that kernel developers have been doing for years and years no longer worked with the, the new model. So there, there was some pushback there, some frustration, but, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a tax for uh, ensuring the hermeticity of the build. So it, it is there for good reason, but it did break some existing workflows. Uh, and then last comment I'm going to mention is uh, the de de debugging. So the sandbox I was mentioning earlier does complicate some things with debugging. Uh, so by default, uh, after the build is complete, it'll clean up the sandbox. So if there were any breadcrum breadcrumbs there that would help you to debug your build issue, um, th those disappear unless you pass a special flag. Uh, and then there are also uh, just long sandbox paths in, in your debug messages that tend to confuse people. So I think I'll quit there and stop for questions. I have some backup if, if we need, but yeah, any questions? Yeah, so I, I didn't get into it here, but uh, pretty recently DDK did add the ability to have uh, def config snippets in um, in like the tech pack repo and the external module repo. And you can still go depend on those and you, you can set that as your config or concatenate them with your own config. Uh, so you can still kind of cross reference those just with the, the Bazel label to that file. And maybe Matthias can talk to that more. But. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, but yeah. So, so in general, you're, you're right. The the dot config does come from the kernel build that you put into the DDK module, but then you can kind of have a, a supplemental, uh, I guess, feature flags for for your module. Uh, so that was pretty common for our tech packs. They would have uh, they would have feature flags that they wanted to define for various platforms. So nowadays in our vendor tree, we would have uh, the tech packs would have a different def config per platform based on what features are available for that platform. Uh, and then I think those are just concatenated onto the dot config. All right, I can't hear you. The uh, dot configs. Oh, um, yeah. So the question was, are they still implemented as header files? Um, I I don't believe so. Uh, I think they I think under the hood, DDK generates. Uh, an actual dot config and then autoconf.h is generated to, to resolve those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have a solution for this with Pixel, but I was curious if you know, more about the whole Yeah. Um, as as far as I know, what we're doing today is the the def config snippets in in the various uh, like per platform. John Stoltz. <laughs> Yeah, so so we do have some non-Android targets where we have been using Cleef, um, and it, it has been been working well. Uh, basically, it's a, a similar situation we were talking about where uh, you kind of have conflicting build systems, right? The Android build system uh, eventually works down to that Android.mk file. A different build system like Yocto would do a similar thing, and you'd have a bit bake that would go and invoke the um, go and invoke the basil build command and produce the dot ko uh, it would be much more elegant if everything was basil obviously um, we have some uh, dependencies that are defined in two places now um, so we're, we're open once the the whole android system shifts that way then yeah it'd be easier there's another small follow-on is as um Qualcomm's been upstreaming code. Mm -hmm. I know in the past there's been occasional situations where, you know, the what gets upstreamed and then what's in the product can slightly vary, and that mm. sometimes can cause some collisions and friction. And I was just curious if you had been running into that as well with this new model. Uh, we haven't okay. uh, seen this issue with DDK yet. I, I think we're just now starting to upstream stuff with DDK. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm not sure. Okay. I also haven't been with Qualcomm that long, so I'm not <laughs> sure about the history there. You mentioned a con was that the, all your developers had to learn this new Khalif build system. Uh, were there any resources that were particularly helpful trying to uh, get that rolled out? Yeah, so I, I would say the majority of the tech teams uh, mostly just copied and pasted a template that we had. Uh, <laughs> there, there, were, there were a few tech teams that were very interested and actually did learn the system, and others would kind of copy their work. But uh, for the ones that actually did uh, learn it, I, I found some uh, some talk on YouTube from a Basil Con. I think that was kind of like a, a one day introduction to Basil, and that was that was helpful to get the semantics of everything. Um, so I, I would recommend that. Got about a minute left. Okay, lovely. Thank you.